Alors, pour ceux et celles qui se joindre à nous aujourd'hui, bonjour. Hello to everyone who is joining us just now. My name is Hugo Lapointe. There is interpretation available today in different languages. You can access this at the bottom of your screen. You can select the language of your choice. You should be able to see interpreting. Great speakers and all of you to this uh, important webinar for a piece of work that Mining Watch Canada, EG Atlas, in collaboration with 25 communities of the Americas have put together over the last year. Um, according to the World Bank and the uh, International Energy Association, uh, the planet uh, societies would need up to 3 billion tons of min minerals and metals over the coming decades to assist the energy transition technologies batteries for electric vehicles, wind, solar power. This energy transition has social and environmental impacts uh, uh, related to the extraction of those minerals in different countries, different territories, indigenous and non-indigenous throughout the Americas and in fact throughout the planet. But today we uh, are lucky to have uh, presentations from different parts of the continent throughout the Americas that will speak uh, with us, that will present their respective uh, realities on the ground of what this uh, mining for the energy transition means uh, for them. But first, uh, please let us welcome um, Mariana Walker, joining us from Barcelona, Spain, uh, as well as Yannick Daniel, uh, joining us today from Mexico, but initially, originally from France. Um, they're both part of the EG Atlas team, uh, the Environmental Justice Atlas team. Mariana Walker is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And Yannick holds a master degree in geography at the University of Grenoble, France and they both work for the Environmental Justice uh, Project. Yannick, Mariana, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, you together with us over the last year and the communities on the ground have put together a great report and a great interactive map that is being launched today officially. Uh, Mariana, can you present us the report and map um, to you, Mariana? Um. Yes, I then will go on. Thank you, Hugo, for the presentation. Uh, gracias a todos y todas por estar aquí. Seguir. Thank you to everyone for being here today. I'm going to continue with my presentation in Spanish. Yes, my name is Mariana Walter. I am a researcher with the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology from the Autonomous University of Barcelona, and I'm here with Yannick Daniel, also a member of uh, the ATLAS team. So today we would like to be presenting to you this collaborative work and the report that has uh, come out of it, uh, what uh, Hugo just mentioned. So over the past year, we have indeed been working with communities, different groups, organizations, researchers in a collaborative effort to raise awareness around the unsustainability and social injustice of uh, all of the mining that is going on in Latin America and also throughout uh, the world. But today I'm going to be focusing on Latin America. So today we are going to be sharing a report on based on this collaborative work that was carried out. And we documented 25 different cases of a mining conflict and focused on three different uh, minerals, copper, lithium, uh, and uh, in, uh, copper, lithium, and uh, one other mineral that unfortunately the interpreter missed, but these are the uh, commonly used uh, minerals and commonly mined minerals in Latin America. As part of the uh, this collaborative work, we wanted to raise awareness around the um, sort of trickery and uh, the lies behind the whole greenwashing uh, movement. 
I I wanted to share with you a couple of aspects from the uh, collaborative process. And that third mineral was uh, graphite. The, we would like to start by thanking the uh, different groups that uh, helped us and allowed us to carry out all of this work. So we have a list of all of these organizations uh, here on the slide. These are organizations from Quebec, uh, from elsewhere in Canada, the United States, Mexico, Peru, uh, Chile, Argentina, uh, Panama, Mexico. There are many different countries that we could have worked with, but that was not possible in this first step of our mapping project uh, for uh, mapping mining conflicts across the continent. And now uh, you can see uh, here the uh, the list of uh, contents, the table of contents. And I would just like to say that this is currently available in Spanish. And we hope that over the coming weeks, we will be able to share a version translated at least into English so that it can be uh, shared in other countries. But for the time being, you can access the report in Spanish. I would like to just quickly go over some of the, uh, the main contents of this import. Uh, uh, this report. So first of all, we would like to uh, share this, um, the list of uh, the main uh, minerals and elements, which you can see on the slide here along the bottom. And so we looked at these elements in particular. And here you have different uh, projections uh, that come from the World Bank and the International Energy Agency. And this shows the exploding demand for different uh, metals and minerals that will be needed for the um, electric uh, transition. So the, the shift to electric cars and uh, renewable energies and so on. The World Bank, uh, estimates that if we continue with this current uh, transition to uh, electrical energy, we would need uh, 300, um, uh, three, 3 billion tons of minerals and metals in order to power this uh, energy transition. So here in the graph, you can see the shift from 2020 to 2040. So this is the first part of the report. And in the second part of the report, we analyzed the 25 different cases that uh, we studied collaboratively and that look into the different environmental impacts of the energy transition. So uh, what happens in fragile and uh, protected areas and key uh, biodiversity regions impacts on water, uh, pollution impacts on livelihood and on uh, heritage sites, uh, important religious sites for the communities that are affected by this. We also highlight the lack of information and the lack of participation, the lack of consultation with communities as well uh, on the part of uh, the advocates of these uh, projects uh, and those who are who are running these projects the last part of the report uh, we also used to document the different types of discourse around green mining. Uh, and so we talk about what we see in these different 25 cases in uh, the report that we looked at. So issues of ethics and uh, the uh, type of information that is being shared by governments and uh, the, the um, what false information is behind them. So we will have people uh, here today to be able to share more with us about what is really happening on the ground. We also wanted to point out that it doesn't necessarily just have to do with the individual impact of these uh, projects. It is the uh, cumulative effect of all of these projects, not just on specific communities, but on ecosystems around the world and some places that act uh, as important um, 
uh, ecosystems that really um, control how the environment uh, functions. And we will be going shortly to Yannick, who is going to be taking us through the map and uh, sharing us, uh, sharing with us the different uh, projects that we analyzed. The map that we are showing to you today is only the beginning. It's the beginning of a mapping project that we want to take to a global level and to uh, and a map that will be able to show us different kinds of struggles. So we have uh, different projects here that uh, show us uh, what sort of costs we are dealing with. We want to look at, uh, we want to ask the right questions. Who and for what purpose is this uh, mining being done? And we want to be able to ima imagine a different and better kind of world. So we will very much be appreciating your contributions uh, to the discussion. And I will send uh, the, the floor over to Yannick now to carry things on. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. I'm going to share my screen. Can you all hear me? Oui. So in order to see this interactive map that Mariana just told you about, uh, and we will be, uh, we will give you the uh, link in the chat so that you can get to it and also at the uh, website so ejatlas.com uh, you should be able to find it that way and then along uh, the menu on the right hand side or rather that's ejatlas.org uh, you'll be able to uh, see all of the different projects in the menu and then you can select the one that you would like to learn more about so if we click uh, then it will open up this map and you will see that, of course, there are more than 25 points because in the end, uh, this interactive map shows the 25 zones of, uh, or conflict zones that we analyzed, of course, across the continents. But on top of that, we also included in this map other cases that were previously documented. Uh, especially uh, when we uh, looked at certain cases that are particularly important, we wanted to include them. And so in the end, the result that we have is something quite a lot more broad than just the cases that we specifically looked at. It's quite simple. You can zoom in. If you see blue points, that's lithium. Orange is copper, green is graphite and other minerals, and red is nickel. If you click on a specific case, I may will be showing uh, us shortly uh, a little bit more about this, but for now, you'll see that you can access a description and then you can open it up to see the entire information sheet and then you can uh, see all kinds of different information about the project, about the impact, the discourse around it, what is the mining company saying about this particular project. And then also we see, you know, the contrast, of course, between that discourse and what is actually happening. And you have information from that come from the people living in those uh, regions and those who are affected. You can access the information in different languages. You can see on the left here. So it will show up in English first, but you, of course, can uh, click on French, for example. This is happening in Quebec. And so we've got the information in French as well. 
that's how all of the cases work in this interactive map. And uh, there's always a seri uh, series of uh, information plus the report itself. So you can click on uh, that link to access the whole report on it. And uh, then we've got everything once again in the different languages here. Here we have English, French, and Spanish. And then we also have a legend and that will open up different uh, cartographic uh, information. So for example, things that come up in the report, here we have Ramsar sites. So we have, for example, the proximity uh, to certain sites of uh, important um, uh, water sites, so Ramsar sites, for example, waters uh, or rather areas that have uh, different environmental importance, how close is the project to them, you get to see that uh, comparison, basically. And then another example, you know, is it near a protected area or so on. And we see that many of those cases are in zones that are in a very stressful situation and so that the idea of being able to complete it with other uh, layers of cartography and so that also to complete as mariana said with documentation of new cases unfortunately the situation is much more concerning and the you know, I'm, there are many more conflicts and and so that we hope that we'll be able to continue with this initiative in a collaborative way so we can continue continuing this map of the americas but at some point we would like to register what is happening in other continents where there is other new impacts and concerning situations for the extraction of these same minerals or other minerals as and so that i'm going to stop here to allow our other speakers and so that be able to show very well the great question with an energy which is hierarchical just trying to make this this transition which is dominated by the major corporation and mining companies and this country prediction because of environmental and social impacts when we're trying to solve an environmental problem. And rather than going on with this, I will end here to turn the floor over to our other speakers. Thank you, Yannick. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, congratulations on this uh, important work. Um, so uh, before we go on to our next uh, speaker, I would like to invite all participants to share questions that they may have in the Q&A section. And I would like to invite our panelists today to feel free to go in this Q&A section and provide written answers if you want. Uh, we don't need to wait until the end of the presentation to start answering some of the questions. Um, I do also retain uh, an important um, a message from Mariana and Yannick that this work uh, is uh, representing a sample of 25 cases that are in the report. It's, a, it's important to understand that there are many more cases as it was mentioned. And uh, forward, AG Atlas and other communities and partners will continue to document more cases. So thank you again, Mariana and uh, Yannick for this work. Uh, our next uh, speaker, if I don't know if uh, Val could put her on the screen, and May, you may um, you may turn on your camera uh, if you can. There you go. Our next speaker is May Daguerre. Uh, May Daguerre has a degree or degrees, I should say, plural. Uh, in literature and business administration. She was most recently a director of the Quebec Association of Pediatricians, a position she held for over 18 years. May is one of the spokespersons for
for the Citizens Coalition Opposed to the Nouveau Monde Graphite Project um, in the Lactoro uh, Regional Park Watershed in Quebec, Canada. It's a group that represents more than 100 families, residents, cottagers, and workers in the region. May, welcome. And uh, the floor is yours to do your presentation. Bonjour, je me présente May Daguerre. De... Uh, my name is May Daguerre, member of the administrative committee of the coalition of, of those that oppose the Nouveau Monde Graphite in Old Madrid. And I, Dimitri Kazetti is here with me, who will be answering your questions later on. But just before I start, I would just like to mention that this coalition of the opponents to the mining projects was created in 2013. It puts together citizens from different sectors of the Minister of Saint Michel de Clan, so that who the objective of uh, opposing the mining projects to be able to preserve the true nature of Saint Michel de Clan. What we would like to do today is to testify of what we are experiencing concretely in the field with the, the, the uh, 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 sustainable uh, destruction, an ongoing destruction, which is happening. So that before we go on, I'd like to have a disclaimer. The opinions presented here are not necessarily representative of the opinions or point, viewpoints of the associations, employers, or the workplaces of the members of the administrative committee of the COPH. So the next slide, we come into the actual pith of the subject. What is the real en environmental price for our Tesla style battery? If we take it example of the Model S, according to the data obtained by MindWatch Canada uh, to create uh, the, this within uh, 73 kilograms of graphite, so that the miner will create mining uh, waste of 4.8 tons, wastewaters of 1,222 liters, and uh, we, green gas emissions of 0.4 tons of CO2. So where does the graphite come from? The graphite comes from, from the biggest open air mine in the south of Quebec, uh, the first in the in the 180 kilometers from Montreal, and less than two hours away from Montreal. It is situated in the National Park of Mont Blanc, between rather the Mont National Park and the Regional Park of Lac Toro, a, a, a vacation area in a very fragile ecosystem, a very sensitive uh, environment, a, a, a recreation and tourism area which is well known both nationally and internationally well known. Next slide. Que le de what does the Matawini Nouveau Monde Graphite, it, it, it is a pit that is 2.7 kilometers long, 430 meters wide and 240 meters deep. And as waste, it, it creates four, they could have four million tons per year. Uh, more than 100 million tons over for 25 years. And in terms of its graphite production, uh, there's only 100,000 tons a year. And of these 100,000 tons, only 42,000 tons a year for electric car anodes. Next slide. What is the strategy that Nouveau Monde Graphic has used to be able to sell this project, which finally will be in the tourism and, and sensitive area in order to, uh, to uh, gild the, so that they present it as being a sustainable project and one that is responsible to being clean and green. 
that is a, a, a fully electric mind. And so Nouveau Monogafi is a, both of respecting the environmental criteria, social criteria, and those and good governance principles. So that but we're re repeating the same message, whether it be at the level of the, the companies that might be interested uh, for the government and and for citizens as, as like ourselves, and the message eventually goes through. So this is a PR campaign, which is very well handled and with constant and intelligent propaganda, basically pure propaganda. And unfortunately, what is the actual, what are the facts? We're very far from responsible extractivism. Uh, and this is something that is deceiving the population. There's a lack of transparency on real impacts. And so that it's got completely uh, opposed to the criteria of uh, efforts of sustainable destruction, deforestation, and so the uh, pollution of the environment, the pollution of the waters of the area, of the lakes in particular. And so that there's nothing positive that can come out of this project uh, as it is presented in the cur currently. And they use a, a methodology of co-availability who, whose the proof of viability has not been made, a methodology that doesn't actually exist, at least in our climate. And Nouveau Mon Graffite continues to mention that it's a, a clean project and there are major doubts that have arisen and the message that continues to go through as if it's a saying that it's a green project. I'm going to show you a little video that shows you the there's a strong odor of sulfur coming from the phase of the project. From phase one of the sulfur, the smell of sulfur. And this is a territory that is covered and that has been de deforestation has been started. And the, the uh, water from the wells that are used for the mean and the impact on, at La Copier, which is huge, the neighboring and other uh, wetlands will be impacted. We expect to have a flow of 466 cubic meters per day. Imagine that this mine put onto Mount Royal Park, and as much as you see here, it would cover the whole park the whole surface and also it would cover a, a great part of the uh, su surface of Central Park. So what are the environmental issues that are ahead of us? If we go to the next slide. I'm going to go without the slides. This seems to be a problem with this. Ah. No. no, that's not the right slide. Here we are. So what are the environmental issues? There are a number of them. Contam water contamination, which is probably forever. We're talking about surface waters and also aquifer. We're talking about uh, mining waste, a huge uh, environmental to, to, to go on, a loss of uh, biodiversity, the equivalent of 100 million tons of mining waste, a part of which is uh, generates acidity. And so that this is going to, if the, the cold disposition without it is not uh, a, a approved that we're going to have a contempt of the Matamac River and we'll end up in Toro Lake. Uh, the, la the loss of biodiversity, we talk about noise, of, uh, of trucking, 
of fine particles and then a considerable increase in green and in green gas greenhouse gases which allows us to think that they have not shown that the they are electric during the audiences in 2020 the, the, the hearings in 20 they were there to can for the whole of 25 is they were going to supposed to talk with so with green air, but not so so social vision social division and rather that the promoter has 86 percent of acceptance of the project which is completely false this is that 50 percent of the population was not consulted during the survey 50 percent of the population that are against this project the indigenous nations that we are for another aspect of the Latino one uh, Tikamek, Manawana Tikamek population, they were never put that all the promoter says he has an agreement with the Tikamek uh, uh, nation, which is uh, uh, false according to the Tikamek council uh, as presented in the last few months. Impacts on health, uh, very high as risks in terms of mental health, of, which is already begun, and also at levels of physical health problems, including to go, or lung problems, governance issues. The main shareholder, Nova Moncafit, is Palinkhurst Group, which is, a, which is associated to a number of entities in a tax shelter in order to change so much such as uh, either Cayman Islands and others lobbying. Uh, we uh, there is a, a process that is going on. There is a series of greening strategies as we reported before and negligence of the recognitions of the BAP, which is the Environmental Protection uh, Entity. And so, in February 2021. They emitted a decree for authorizing in a hidden fashion without obtaining previously uh, the additional studies that were required, if not demanded before any former president by the, the BAB, and which it, it deals directly with environmental issues such as co disposition. Uh, our, the fact that the mine is not being demonstrated to be fully electric, very important. Uh, and the government has been in your this, this is total deception. And so the, 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 the dream is sustainable, clean energy, responsible minerals and an electric mine. What we have are mining ways, uh, sustainable destruction, social impacts, and which is uh, the begun already with people who are leaving distress of an anxiety and people who are talking about dynamiting. This is real. It's something that's already started and about greening, uh, environmental greening, and which is saying that it's supposed to be so green that some people end up believing it. So there are any solutions to this sustainable destruction? Yes, there are, if we have the courage to take the decision of, to go forward on this, such as reducing cons uh, consumption at the source, one of the five conditions so that the electrification of transportation will have a better mining. And so the, this is something that they're going to do. That is to reconsider the legislation on mines and those territories are incompatible with mining activities to be able to control this industry better. Remember that this is the first time in the history of Quebec where we find in a tour, tourist and sensitive with dynamiting and a pit and the, the things that will be going on forever and to put our political for, for responsible consumption and production of strategic minerals. If the government wants really to, wants to go head towards uh, electrification of transportation as citizens, not, we are not experts, we are only citizens. But these are possible solutions that we as citizens ask the government to uh, establish in order to, to uh, diminish the mining impacts of the energy transition. It's extremely important 
This is an example that can prove or show uh, improvement at this level. We hope so. Uh, we wish so. And uh, well, so thank you very much, May. Um, and uh, I don't know, Val, if you could uh, cue in Gary uh, on the screen. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, guest speaker um, from uh, Nevada is Gary uh, McKinney uh, from the Western Shoshone Northern Paiute Nation, member of the Northeastern Nevada people of Red Mountain, affected by the Lithium Americas Thacker Pass project. Very close, in fact, to um, the Tesla uh, car mega factory. But, be, but before we hear um, Gary, uh, let's uh, see a video that uh, he wanted us to uh, project for you all today. Biggest problem is we look at today, we look at ourselves. Yeah, we're comfortable. Yeah, we still got water. But what, what's it going to be like in the future? Nobody can really say what's what's going to happen with that water. I don't think there's enough tests on on the uh, toxins that they're adding to retrieve the, the the precious metals. I don't think that people fully are aware of what's going to happen year after year, or 20 years, or 100 years, or 50 years from now, as to what trouble that's going to bring them. The land to me is still 26 million acres of Nevada long land still belongs to Western Shoshone people. That treaty has never been taken away. Understand the, the native people. Let, give us a chance. We're not trying to chop your head off. We're not trying, we're trying to do things right to protect what we have left of our, our, our sites. You know, where we're headed now to the novel that these issues were raised. They were they were brought up by a lot of bands. A lot of bands and and God's group took it to court. But where did we end up? But everybody knows as soon as mining's done, this is what they this is the remnants. This is what they leave behind. So Gary, welcome. Hello everybody, thank you. Thank you everybody for uh, for allowing me this space. Um, it's an honor to be sitting here um, among you guys. And uh, I'm here to, to shed a little light on on behalf of uh, the people of Red Mountain, Atsaf, Kodapa, Winuwu. Uh, we're, that's our tribal name, our, his, our tribal uh, historical name known among our tribes and our bands um, out here in northern Nevada we're facing off with the with the lithium mine project um, that was rushed through the EIS which is the environmental impact statement uh, was rushed through in a in a, a process that should be four to five years it took them less than a year to compile enough uh, research that they claim is enough uh, to move forward with this project and here we are um, along the way <clears throat> we ran into things like um, a historical site we need a we are asking for recognition with our our massacre site because um, we are descendants of um, one of the the gentlemen that escaped from that um, he got out of the massacre alive the lone adult survivor um, so along the way, he rode to these different places, and now these places are are under um, these lands are under attack with uh, uranium test drilling, with uh, lithium test drilling, with this lithium mine. Uh, Thacker Pass is it will be the the biggest lithium mine in uh, in the area, in the country, possibly the the world. Um, and here we are. We're we're trying to fight. Uh, fight for our culture, fight for our history, and ensure that our children, our children have a good future. Um, we bring it to a large scale. And uh, <clears throat> along with um, this COVID pandemic, uh, COVID, as we all know, is a respiratory illness. It's a virus that doesn't, it's not, 
easily to go away in your lungs. Once it's in your lungs, it may stay there. There's not, it's not, uh, a, there's no conclusive test to say that these, uh, this virus, COVID-19, is going to go away in the next 5, 10, 50 years. And so playing in part of our opposition, we, we're, we're letting people know that this COVID virus, um, we, we're going to need <clears throat> this clean air. We need this, this, this clean air if we want to be living without masks covering our faces. Um, we need to be uh, aware that we're leaving this big scar on this earth for our children, for our next generations to come that aren't here yet, our grandchildren. Uh, so we speak in to honor our ancestors, those that are, are in our history that have passed, that have um, made that made made it known that our people are still here to to defend the land and to make sure that you know we have clean water and clean air and now we're we're up against these jobs these jobs that make money profits this green energy format that they have is not green because these are the people the companies and corporations that don't see the forest for the trees they see what you know they, they want to clear everything out so that they could get underneath that ground and extract whatever they want that's public public lands they do that they get their 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 client their claims out there um and so we have this general mining law of 1872 and a lot of people can agree to this that it needs to be uh it needs to be done away with or abolished or you know it needs to be worked on because 1872 uh, here in America was around the year of the Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant had in mind donkeys, pick pickaxes, and shovels. Uh, they were mining with donkeys, and there's pictures out there. You can Google it. Um, and here we are. It's This lithium project is being dictated by that same 1872 mining law. And here it's a transition between green energy. This is... Uh, 1872 before light bulbs before electricity it's dictating how we want to go about electric vehicles lithium batteries those are all electrical so you see that contradiction in that contrast where we obviously need to start coming together to make a change and our, our smaller communities especially our indigenous communities um, we have been through this historical trauma and this lithium mining project here on our homelands, it, it's not the only reason for, for us being, you know, being de defensive with our land. It only adds to the, the, the big picture with us, and it's not known to everybody. Just like our, our struggles here throughout the summertime, we see, we see smoke. They're, the visibility is so low, you can't see a mile in front of you because there's so much smoke. And this happens every year. It's getting thicker and thicker every year. You look up at, at noon and the sun will be red. And, you know, that's, that's the type of air quality that we have to deal with on this side of the map of America, the United States. We call it Turtle Island. Uh, so we're sitting here on this west side of the map dealing with these, these fires, dealing with, with the, the, water, the water shortages. And the people that's in power that's, that's playing a big big hand on these these mining projects they don't see that they don't they don't smell the smoke they don't see the smoke it it literally looks like it's snowing in the middle of summertime because the ash is coming coming down from the sky and it's all around us and this is northern nevada where this mining project is going to be and i've said this in front of the ndep folks that were operating over there in washington dc um you know that we need to take care of we need to take care of this land mother earth because she has everything that we need to sustain ourselves water air food medicines we have all that here and it's hard to to make that that correlation that connection between us and other people because it's not known we've got, we've had a gag order on us for so long now and now this transition between green energy is a catalyst for a lot of our, our indigenous brothers, sisters, our relatives out there. Like line three, there's, there's uh, Protect Hockamway. It's a, 
it, there's a, a lithium mine in Arizona on Hualapai. It's a indigenous tribe. They're going through the same process as we are. Sacred sites going down, being sacrificed in the name of lithium. And here we are, nobody's saying, you know, what we have to go through for you to have your cell phone, for them to have to be driving driving around with a Tesla. Um, it's literally the way that we see it, literally mining. It's a, it's a, a water mining project, mining water <clears throat> at, at 50,000 gallons of water per metric ton of lithium. Uh, where are we going to get all that water from where we are? It's, it's a, practically a desert out there. And people do their research. That's where lithium can be found in, in desert regions. But the biodiversity there is still thriving. If you water the, the ground over there, there's going to be grass growing. And they plan to erase all that along with our cultural sites, burial sites. There's things like as small as arrowheads, but then there's things as helpful to us like medicines that have been helping us through this COVID pandemic. Because we don't really, really depend on Western medicines to fix ourselves. We're the people that were here before before Christopher Columbus that had it figured out. We had these medicines. We were we were one about we were we were one with with this earth out here. And to disregard the animals, the human life, the the birds, you know, all of us, to disregard all of us in the name of profit, to hide all of it under the, the title of green energy is not right. It's not fair. That 1872 mining law right here in America should be the first thing that changes when it comes down to consultation with us Native Americans and a big money-making corporation like Lithium America. We, to us, this land matters. We see the trees, the forests for the trees. There is a lot there, there is a lot of life back there. There's these mountains, and it's beautiful. Why should we put a big hole in the ground in exchange for that so that people elsewhere can get that lithium? In the truest sense, in, in, the, most, in the most truest sense, we are the ones sacrificing our culture, our history, and they're not believing us when they ask us about our stories. We're facing with a federal district, a federal court, that has never been on our side to begin with. Um, 1872 mining law will bring it. It will. It will. It it okay's the paperwork. It aligns paperwork so that we're secondary to that paperwork, and they push it. They push it, and it's because we don't have that type of money. We don't have those kinds of resources yet to fight for our land, to make to preserve our land, to put what we can to you know like there's massacre sites out here in america that that have protection orders on it like it would be if we have a protection order on it that would be the same as us going over to arlington cemetery and putting a shovel in the ground that would be one and the same but we're the people that don't see that we don't do that we don't want to do that we don't we don't take that disrespect you know because we're out here living it for free we're not going to work at eight o'clock being paid to stay there until five to make problems for people like like us like like some of us out there i've been hearing and that needs to change also and this is a good good way a good way to really be um interactive with you know because we're we should all be looking at our lands as our homes I'll say one more thing, you know, like we, we really, I personally believe it like this. We are caretakers of this mother earth. It, this would be like any, any mining, let's say any, any kind of mining project out there, we would have to consider ourselves going into somebody else's home and destroying things, putting things where they don't belong, breaking glass, writing on the walls, take, you know, breaking things and wrecking the whole house just in general and then we leave but we lock the door you know that it, it's the same thing we don't we don't like to do that we don't want to do that but we're finding ourselves in a justice system 
that will literally protect things like that in these smaller groups underneath them that claim to mitigate will only soften the blow but you can't put a price on our culture you can't put a price on our, our artifacts our oral history it's not for sale it's not for sale we don't we don't want to be disrespected and we we want all of our people because we're we're pro people we're pro environment we're pro people we want we want to see our youth and our kids away from cell phones outside playing building relationships dancing singing having fun learning experiencing life so that they may get old and reflect back on it they can be a good elder and teach their young ones and their young ones and so on and so forth that's what our you know that's what our protection of our homelands is really about and that's all i want to leave here with with you know with, with this time and this space here we're out here we're a small tribe we're not like the lakota we're not like the sioux we're not big in numbers we're small but we are mighty and we 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 know our history we have been learning our our oral traditions since we since the day we're old enough to learn and a lot of a misconception will be that our reservations where we are uh doesn't we don't hold water but to us our history says a lot more that we are all we were all walking on the same trail we were all hunting in these the same ways on the same lands but at different times and it's only until this colonization of america happened that was forced forced upon us then boarding schools happen and then you know these these tra these historical trauma events start happening and so now our elders wish to have our lands preserved and that's the way that um that us as young ones will, will honor that um for our medicines for our water for our air for our people that's the fight that we're out here in northern nevada um the Thacker Pass with the mining project is not green. Um, you could uh, you could find me anywhere on Facebook. I'm out there. Um, please continue to support us. Um, yeah, I I do believe that uh that I have said everything that I need uh, that I need to say for now. I appreciate everybody for coming in, listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for your testimony. You you don't see the chat maybe, but there's a lot of uh, thank yous and support coming out. By the way, anybody uh, feel free to share some comments and questions in the chat or even better in the Q&A section for your questions. And feel free to introduce yourself wherever you're coming from today, tonight. Uh, tell us where, where you are, uh, what you're working on. Uh, so for our next two speakers, um, I'll first introduce my colleague, uh, Viviana Herrera, who's the Latin program coordinator um, interim um, for Mining Watch Canada. And so Viviana, I'll let you introduce our next uh, guest speakers. Yeah, thank you so much, Hugo. And thank you to all the, uh, the panelists and May and Gary, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you everyone who's joining us uh, across the Americas, literally from Argentina all the way to Canada. And speaking of Argentina, uh, in the second half of the webinar, we're going to be speaking with two spokespersons uh, from um, two different movements uh, in Argentina and Chile, who've been leading the way in terms of pushing back against uh, lithium, uh, lithium and copper mining uh, uh, for the energy transition. So, uh, but before we uh, introduce our next speaker from Argentina, uh, we would like to uh, show you a very short uh, video clip. It's a, actually a trailer of in the name in the name of lithium. So, uh, take a look.
Los alinee. Para nosotros. The salt flat is very important to us because it is our mother and it is part of our family. Water is the blood of Mother Earth. The amount of water needed for lithium extraction is not here. Our mother cannot be broken, destroyed, or sold. This is the biggest crisis humanity has ever faced. Climate change. Climate change. El gran problema de las energías renovables es que son intermitentes. The big problem with renewable energies is that they are intermittent. Es fundamental. It's essentially batteries. The time. From this point of view, lithium battery storage is essential. Salt flats have lithium. It's the most profitable and the easiest to mine. Hay concesiones mineras sobre casi toda la puna argentina. Millions of liters of water evaporating in the desert. There are mining concessions on almost the entire puna in Argentina. El sacrificio, ¿no? El gobierno tiene deuda con nosotros. Si el gobierno define que eso es importante para... They're condemning us to be the next sacrificed region. The government owes us. If the government decides this is important for the development of the province, then the government will go ahead with it. They're giving it to this company, Gemsa, as if they were the owners. When did they ever consult with the communities? These territories are inhabited by our ancestors and we are going to defend them the way we want to. We are going to be here until the companies are evicted, until they leave. We're going to the extreme, to the extreme of let's cash in on this to save the other thing. But for whom? We're talking about humanity itself. So that was that was it. Uh, Clemente. Uh, yes, so Clemente, welcome. Um, it was a very nice to see you in that uh, documentary. Um, so uh, Clemente, I just want to make sure that Clemente is here with us. Um, okay, Clemente, can you, can you hear us? Nos puedes escuchar, uh, Clemente? I just want to make sure that, because, um, you know, he's having some, um, yeah. Okay, ahí está. Hola, Clemente. Okay. Clemente, so, uh, welcome. Hola, buenas tardes. ¿Me escuchas? ¿Me escuchas? Buenas tardes. Hola, Clemente. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? And so that... Sí. Sí, te uh, You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Te escuchamos. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so, Clemente, uh, so... Clemente. You are part Bu of Buenas the... tardes. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes, Clemente. So before we... Uh, yeah, so before we start, Clemente, I'm going to say something in English. So the audience. I just wanted to make sure uh, to tell everyone that the following two presentations are going to be in Spanish. So if you need a uh, French interpretation, just make sure to click the uh, little globe icon at the bottom of your screen, and then you'll, be, uh, you'll have access to... Uh, French and English uh, simultaneous uh, interpretation. So uh, I just wanted to um, introduce Clemente because I haven't. <laughs> so Clemente is uh, joining us from uh, Northwestern Argentina uh, and he's, um, a, he's part of the indigenous com community uh, of El Angosto and a spokesperson of the Mesa de Pueblos Originarios de la Cuenca de la Laguna Guayatayó y Salinas Grandes. Uh, Clemente, um, so I was saying that it was really nice to see you in that uh, documentary. And uh, I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the, uh, the struggle that the La Mesa de los Pueblos de la, de la Laguna de Guayatayoc um, is going through in order to, uh, to protect the territory. And why it's so important for you to oppose uh, lithium mining in Salinas Grandes. Clemente, ¿escuchaste la traducción? Clemente, did you hear the translation? Clemente? Clemente? This is what happens when you are live. So, si no se... pasa, you can Clemente, hear us. Puedes, uh, adelante. So you can start.
He is a representative of the Mesa de Pueblos Originarios de la Cuenca de la Laguna de Guayatayoc and Salinas Grandes. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Sí, dale. Right. Can I can introduce myself? Go right ahead. I don't know whether you can put on the camera as well. La pago la cámara. Sí. Dale. Perfecto. Okay, go right ahead. You can. Comienzo. Sí. So should I start? Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Clemente Good Flores. Good afternoon, my name is Clemente Flores. I live in the southern Gangosto, in Cucuy, in Argentina. La Cuenca de Salinas Grandes and the Lake of Guayatayoc. I spent a lot of time it would have been dedicated to defending from different types of investments. And so the lake of, uh, so that we are defending the territory, particularly on the subject of water, which is, and so that we've been gone through various communities. And so that uh, there is now an act of lithium mining and the I'm afraid the sound is gone. And different uh, occasions, uh, they have displaced the communities in order to be able to mine lithium. We have been trying to defending the territory, which is very important for our communities. And so that, so that we, we didn't know how to defend that and to see that what how possible this was and so that we've been working in different levels and different types of readings to bring all the communities together to condemn what is going on and we also been working in terms of micro aid in the defense of the territory Okay, gracias, Clemente. Thank you, Clemente. Um, so maybe if you can uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about the importance of um, uh, the, the, the reasons why you oppose uh, lithium mining in Salinas Grandes, the reasons why it's so important for you to organize and mobilize uh, as indigenous communities uh, against uh, the impacts of, of this sort of mining. Um, Clemente, me quiero asegurar de que cuando yo hablo en inglés. I want to make sure when I'm hearing, when I'm speaking English, can you hear me the Spanish translation? Can you hear the translation? Sí, trato de que se traduzca. Uh, the interpreter apologizes, but the sound is cutting in and out. No escuchas nada. Eh, bueno, entonces de pronto si nos puedes hablar en este and momento. So that you can keep talking right now on the struggle that you are carrying at in the method of the basin of Guayatayoc and the Gran Salinas, what you're carrying out now is struggles. I think we're having some issues. La Laguna Guayatayo son 33 comunidades. La Laguna de Guayatayo de Jujuy estamos. The Guayatayo Lake and the basin is and the 23 communities with it working with the basin and they were trying to keep up with what is going the, uh, I'm afraid that, so that it's inhabitable zones that have very little water available. 
este momento de ver. And so that, so how people adapt and how they organize and so that we can defend the, the life in these regions and so that there are kinds of different health problems and so that we organize assistance in the communities and, and so that we are defending it and, and taking care of these people because our people live in these places. And so they come in and they they mine the water to in order to extract the lithium, and so that we don't want to see what is going uh, currently in the communities. And so this is cause a great concern. So that there are many people are opposed to the lithium extraction. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Clement. Uh, and I think that you make a really good point, right? That it's not so much about against lithium or uh, mining, but uh, it's more about uh, the protection of uh, water uh, resources and, and water, because uh, as you just said, uh, water is life, right? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Clemente. Um, I'm not sure if you would like to add something else, or maybe we can uh, continue later on uh, during the Q and A. Over the last while, after the, the pandemic, there are many a number of co more companies that are are roaming the territory, and without actually consulting without involving the communities. And so that we see that the police state, and so that has many forms of subduing the population and impo imposing what they want to do. And this is something that we find very difficult. And so that, and so that unfortunately there's, political power is very involved and some people have come back so that I'm, in spite of the real position of the communities. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Clemente. Uh, thank you for those words. And I think we're gonna come back uh, to you uh, during the q and I'm pretty sure that uh, our audience has pl have plenty of uh, questions for you. And actually, in that regard, I would like to um, remind everyone that you can post your questions on the in the Q&A, and that we're going to get back to to those questions in a in a few minutes. But uh, before we do that, um, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Um, and our next and actually last speaker, who is uh, Sara Gomez Honores. Uh, she's the spokesperson of Puta Endo Resiste. Uh, this is an environmental, social, and cultural group from Puta Endo Chile uh, that um, opposes, uh, that, who opposes the uh, Canadian mining company Los Andes Copper and its uh, Las Vizcachitas uh, project in the Aconcagua uh, Valley. Uh, but before joining Sara and before her uh, telling us about uh, the wonderful work that they do in Puta Endo in order, in order, in order to um, raise awareness, uh, we would like to show you a very short video that they have uh, created. So uh, take a look. ¿Sabías que Puta Endo, el primer pueblo libre de Chile? Hoy se encuentra amenazado por el proyecto minero Vizcachitas Holding que pretende construir una mina a rajo abierto. Este proyecto es de gran envergadura y dejaría sin agua nuestro valle, ya que se ubicaría justo en el centro del río Rocín, que alimenta el agotado río Putaendo, devastando la agricultura local, la ganadería y el rico patrimonio natural y humano de Putaendo. En nuestros valles se han identificado más de 1.300 petroglifos de senderos de Inca y Pucarás. 
fuimos el primer pueblo libre de Chile, porque por aquí ingresó el grueso del ejército de los Andes, ruta que el gobierno argentino ha solicitado sea declarada Patrimonio de la Humanidad por la UNESCO. Heredamos una rica arquitectura patrimonial, donde destacan los corrales del Chalaco, que son monumento histórico nacional, y nuestra comuna declarada como zona de interés. Putaendo es epicentro de una dinámica actividad cultural, con el carnaval más largo de Chile, encuentros de payadores, componedoras de huesos y bailes chinos. La cordillera de Putaendo se encuentra en un estado excepcional, casi salvaje. Es un extenso territorio que da origen a múltiples cuencas andinas que nacen de numerosos glaciares de roca. Estas montañas son el hábitat natural de pumas, cóndores, gatos andinos y guanacos que pastorean sobre increíbles bofedales altoandinos. Esta cordillera se ha descrito como el límite norte y sur de al menos 21 especies de plantas, pues se encuentra en una zona de transición climática entre la árida del desierto de Atacama y la mediterránea del Chile central, propiciando la existencia de abundante flora y fauna nativa. Putaendo es el único valle de la zona central sin gran minería, y así queremos que se mantenga. La empresa canadiense, los Andes Cooper, y las autoridades estatales. Creative team. We thank. Um, Sara, welcome. Uh, that was a great video, very creative. Uh, I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think that you really get a sense of what is at stake, right? Uh, so in that sense, can you, um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, why Putaendo wants to remain um, the only, uh, the only um, uh, city or, or municipality without uh, mega mining? Bueno, hola, buenas tardes. Good uh, afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. First of all, uh, Putaenda doesn't want to be, we don't want to become another sacrifice area as there's so many of it throughout Chile in the north uh, because of mining or because of hydroelectric or there's all kinds of factors that influence our these sacrifice zones. And so we mainly want to Pitondo is resisting, Putendo Resiste is, is a, an environmental organization. And so then for this, I've been involved with protecting the water for over 28 years. And so that I'm part of it. I've been in, in their meetings for many years and we continue to participate with them because we thought it was essential to uh, provide my uh, experience as a leader of the water. So it's the water for human consumption, which is in danger as well as for agriculture. So that first of all, there was, uh, you know, the community because of different manifest uh, demonstrations, they were carried through Patente Resiste, along with many other organizations that all agreed to demonstrate against, uh, and just recently there was a citizens participation where we all, all of the members Have, having been in, 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 in the Congress and in, in the municipality of, for the region and the, so that to end this. And so see, that's what, that wasn't positive for the Putaendo territory. And the mining camp is already in, installed and the actual, the Valley of the River. And so the only source of fresh water for the community by it for small scale agriculture or large scale agriculture, it is the only 
uh, freshwater source for human consumption. And so this is also, uh, there are seven drinking water committees, really five of us. Uh, they uh, deal with superficial disturbance. They were at the basis of the mountain range, and we will we will undoubtedly be impacted by this mining project. And so that the uh, the authorities, the current ones and the future ones, they have not taken us into account at all. They don't care. We, we talk about these five committees. They're talking about the soft flat. So they're not talking about in water in depth, but, but it's 5,000 people that will be exposed during the 365 days a year will be exposed so that the source of water for human consumption could be contaminated with some spill of fu fuel or minerals or some landslide that could uh, occur. And so they will always be uh, with the the, uh, da the danger that Latin, so that our water could be contaminated. A, uh, many things that are very absurd that we've been seeing going on over time. For example, the we are told uh, about GDP, and we're uh, told that this is what Chile lives off, but if you actually look into it, it's from about five to 10%, approximately 10% of the GDP of Chile comes from mining. It's not actually that much. They say that it is uh, the base, uh, the foundation of all of the state's social programs. They have to look at, you know, where they're going to get the money from, but they can't do it, they say, uh, you know, but in truth, what's happening is they're sacrificing communities in order to get this money to then pay for social causes. So it doesn't make any sense. Here in the Putayendo Valley, I, the mining company, Vizcachitas, tells the community that they will bring in a lot of jobs. There is information on the internet, and it turns out that it's 1.3% uh, what uh, they are bringing in terms of job creation for the general population. It's not actually very much at all. These jobs provided by mining companies are almost negligible if you look at it carefully. But, you know, of course, they also bring all kinds of negative impacts in terms of human health. Most people who work for mining companies end up with extreme stress. They have to work for 12 hours a day. They can work up to seven days a week, and then they have seven days off, they say, but it entirely it depends entirely on where they actually are working. Because if somebody from the fifth region goes to work in the fourth or to the second region of Chile, well, then they have to travel, and that takes up a whole lot of their time off. And it also brings a lot of stress this fact that people have to travel around causes a lot of stress and I, the way that they work is very uh, controlled there's uh, they use gps a lot of the time these heavy trucks uh, that they're driving it has to be uh, very clearly scheduled and they are penalized uh, if they uh, go astray in any way whatsoever. So it's very difficult and stressful work. And people are underinformed about what these jobs bring. They're not as great as the mining company would have people believe. 
Like. We've heard also from uh, the other speakers this evening that, of course, there are all of these health problems that come with uh, mining uh, projects. It's not just the people working for them, but also the people who are uh, close to these places of work. Illnesses caused by pollution by uh, sound pollution also, um, you know, the, the uh, eyesores that are created and the effect that that has on people's uh, quality of life live in those uh, regions. People are not, um, you know, it's not like they're left uh, not affected by these major changes in their, uh, in their environment. All of these uh, negative aspects that, you know, people, uh, when they're just trying to get a, a good job, that's all they want, they end up uh, giving away their life. They think that uh, they might be supported by this mining company for the rest of their life, but this is not the case. If they end up uh, getting into an accident, uh, probably the company will look for a replacement. They'll come to a certain compromise and give them a certain amount of money, and that's it. Uh, they just completely forget that the person ever worked for that mining company at all. Sara has just been reminded that she's got one minute left. Water is what is always going to be at risk. And that is what we have always fought for. There are many people that want mining and there are people that uh, don't support them. But for the most part, society is very divided people in the region specifically. Some of them want it and others, you know, in equal numbers. We are trying to share the this information with the people who want mining. We're trying to teach them about the risks that come with the water contamination and the risks that come with working for mining companies. There is no green mining in Chile. There are many, many falsehoods that are being spread. So why is Chile investing so much in mining? Well, it's because there aren't a lot of taxes to pay. It's an easy way to bring in money. Uh, you know, they produce uh, tons and tons of copper. If they produce a certain amount, uh, they don't have to pay uh, for taxes. Uh, and then the uh, foreign investors come and to work in Chile. So that's why there's this draw. All, all these people want to come to Chile to mine because it's uh, very easy to get into this country as a mining company. However, the cost that is being ignored is the human cost, the environmental cost. And at some point we are gonna end up paying this cost. I think that what we need to be doing is standing up to uh, these uh, these mining companies so that they do not pollute the water. And we need to make sure that, uh, you know, for our own healthcare system, of course, we need uh, a constant supply of clean water. And so I think that there is a huge uh, contradiction in Chile when you look at, at that particular aspect here in Putayendo and in Chile in general. Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you so much. And, and I think that this is something very important to, uh, to, uh, to make visible, right? The human and social and environmental cost of um, uh, supposedly uh, green mining, right? So thank you so much for that. It was uh, extremely uh, clear, so thank you. So I think that now we're gonna uh, move on.
Gracias. Uh, we're going to move Thank on now. You. Uh, it's going to be uh, a very, uh, uh, we're going to go right to the point because we know that we're running out of time, but we really have, want to have this space. So uh, I have a question to start. And this is a question for everyone to all uh, our panelists, uh, May, Gary, uh, Sara. I think Clemente had to go because of uh, bad connection. But the question is, uh, if you know which banks or who is uh, financing these projects? I think you already touched a little bit on this, but if any one of you would like to uh, uh, to to make a comment, can you say the question again, please? Like, uh, there is a question. This is actually actually in Spanish, and the question is, who is funding these mining projects? Where where is the money coming from? Um, from my understanding, it. Uh, this lithium uh, mining project in Thacker Pass has investors from Canada. Um, it's it's actually uh, we're up against Lithium Nevada. Uh, lithium America is a bigger company, I believe, and they come from Canada. If I may add. Uh, it's Dimitri from uh, Coalition des Opposants Projets Miens au Trois Avenues. In the case of Nouveau Monde Graphite, um, the financing came originally from the government of Quebec via its investment vehicle, Investissement Quebec, uh, followed up, up uh, by a group of investors who are essentially registered in um, um, in a Vision Fiscal Paradise uh, offshore zone. And they are right now the Pellin First Group, the the major investor of the company. So it's unclear, it's really unclear where and what kind of money are financing this type of projects. And in fact, this raises a lot of questions about the proper government uh, governance of uh, the company and other projects associated with the same investor group, such as Namask Lithium. Thank you, Dimitri. Sara? Eh, eh, sí, efectivamente, por ejemplo, acá yes, yes. And the project on our territory in Canada, I have the major in investors, and they're the ones that, that are ones that are making all the investments. And there's also major operators in Chile, for example. BBH3, Anglo America, Codelco. And so, besides a number of smaller mining companies that are not as present, but they're the ones that make the investments. So that they are to their advantage because they were paid very little. And they're so that the Chile doesn't get much order. It's very convenient to make this type of investments in Chile. Thank you, Sara. Um, and actually, uh, I think we're going to stay with you. Yeah. There is another question for Sara. Uh, and this is, you know, as there are, um, the pres presidential elections are coming up. And so someone asked, uh, what's the position of um, Putaendo Resiste uh, in regards to the upcoming election, uh, in, in regards to the protection of water, the environment? And, you know, we know, as you already mentioned, that the uh, the government is very pro-mining, so. We, how can I say the name? Well, I'm not going to carry a political campaign, but of course, we're in forms of bodies and in all forms. The other person who is a candidate I think that things have been bad up until now in the environment area. I think the, there's a lot to, that we could talk about, but in this moment, we can't do that. But I think it would be even worse if the other person is elected the one who has a majority in this. I think that we have to be a visionary and see what is good for Chile in general. It's now the, are we the ones that are 
being impacted in our territory with the mine companies and with all the deposits. But I think throughout Chile, as the, the, the Salonita, the Iona project as for photovoltaic, which also causes all kinds of problems because they it's, it's cleaner energy, but they're doing this in places that are not appropriate and where there's a human uh, price to pay. So that I disagree with these government decisions. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. I think I'm gonna give the, uh, I'm gonna pass it to Hugo. Oh yes, thank you, uh, Viviana. Uh, today, uh, we had uh, two questions uh, raised from uh, journalists that are interested on in this issue. One of the question was, um, considering that we need to move away from oil and gas to uh, for the energy transition and the need for minerals for batteries and wind and solar, um, how, how are we supposed to go forward to, so basically the uh, question was, you know, are there some places where it can be mined safely uh, or not? So that's the question for all of you. I don't know how you handle this, this question in your own regions. Yeah, I had, this is Gary, um, Dr. Pass. Um, with that transition, I, I believe that we, uh, <clears throat> we don't really need to be trying to solve one mistake for another. Um, so when we, when we think about these other areas that need mining, <clears throat> that, you know, I shouldn't say need mining, but if there was another area that was projected at being mined, it would be another community that would be feeling the pain going through the hurt. It would be another community. So, you know, it's one of those, those things, you know, it, it's, it's happening in our backyard. Um, it's not always, you know, it shouldn't always be left up to the jobs, the people in those jobs to decide for, you know, our, our livelihoods. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Any other Want to add to this, uh, Sarah or Dimitri or John? We also have John Hatter there. Yeah, I'll let John uh, speak. I think he, he wanted to, to add something. I'll just speak briefly. Um, we're also in uh, Nevada working on the uh, Thacker Pass area as well, but uh, this is a common problem. Uh, the different different mines use their different techniques in Thacker Pass. It's a clay deposit, which would use a sulfuric acid leaching method. Uh, other processes use a heat and other chemical techniques. Um, the ones down in Chile and Bolivia, we're hearing about, we're talking about water use. And so there's really, it's hard to find a uh, kind of responsible approach. The really only responsible approach is the one that's acceptable to the communities that are affected. Um, in terms of the other piece of the question is also, uh, it's, it's important to keep in mind that there are things that we can be doing to minimize the demand so that we don't have this enormous pressure that's on frontline communities. Uh, particularly in the United States, our transportation system is enormously inefficient in terms of how many people are occupying single occupancy vehicles. And there's, we saw during COVID enormous decrease in uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, transportation sector. Um, so I think the commitment has to be to uh, think about a more transformative process in our societies, not just about where do we get the next, uh, where, where's the next gold mine, so to speak. So that's part of what we're working on as well. I just wanted to kind of put that out there also, that we have to look to other means besides extraction. Thanks a lot. Thank you, John. And um... If, if, if we could add, uh, you know, we, we do witness at Mining Watch Canada in a Quebec or Canadian context that there are uh, nations that have uh, agreed, uh, First Nations that have agreed to some uh, lithium mines or nickel mines, um, but others that, that uh, squarely oppose to it. So I guess part of the answer uh, depends on um, the communities and the lands and the, uh, that are affected 
Um, there's also in the chat box, there's a number of folks, thank you for all your sharing that have, uh, yes to life, no to mining, have shared some uh, so-called red lines, um, uh, go, no go uh, projects. My, my last question um, that I have, and it's a, tr it's a tricky question, and it's for Mariana, Yannick, and the whole research team of um, the EG Atlas for this particular uh, project. Uh, the journalist asked, of all the 25 cases that you've uh, researched and documented, which ones were the worst cases? <laughs> so I know it's a, it's a tricky question, but the journalist had in mind, I'm just sharing her question, um, you know, given that we consume most of those minerals in the north, in the global north, Europe, North America, isn't it better that we mine it here than in the south? Um, it's a tri tricky question. So I'll let Mariana or, or Yannick, maybe as researchers uh, that have interacted with 25 cases. Today we had four featured, but there, there's more cases. So Mariana. Thank you, Hugo. First, to invite everybody to check the report because we actually highlight for some of the main grievances and impacts, what are the cases that better illustrate some of this? Because I wouldn't dare to say which one is the most affected one, but you have some that are very violent against communities with very strong criminalization and, and police violence, for instance. You have others when you see that what's put at risk is really, really important ecosystems to regulate the climate or to regulate the water or large questions about how some projects and the sum of projects in some areas like the Salares, the, the salt lands, are only not affecting the specific place of the project, but the addition of all these projects are putting in danger the full watersheds, complete ecosystems. So it's not about the individual projects, but it's the sum of all these projects that really putting at risk communities, but really actually the full ecosystems and the climate itself. We are putting at risk with mining and deforestation related to mining the Amazons, glaciers, water sources. So it's about the big picture, not only the individual projects that also matter, of course. So I would invite to broaden the scale at which we are looking at the problem beyond the specific uh, struggles. This is also the intention of mapping to also show these overlaps with, uh, with the areas of water scarcities, uh, ecosystems, biodiversity hotspots. All of this is put at risk. And it's not only about us humans, it's about the nature broad, more broadly. So, and I would also, regarding the previous question the community speaking to us today culture of course worldviews called full societies are put at risk and these are also reflected in the map and in the report but i also say that what we are also showing in the report is that these communities that are struggling against the expansion of mining are actually had actually a very marginal role in actually creating the climate change that now is fostering these policies for energy transition. So we are here, this is a full issue of justice as well, that we are not addressing correctly with the questions we sometimes make. So I would also raise the question of, is this an energy transition we want? For what? For who? Do we want to really mine lithium for individuals? individual electric cars? Should we asking about consumption in the global north, about the type of transportation we want? So I think we need to go back to these broad questions about consumption, energy consumption, transportation, ways of living, diversity, diversity of ways of developing our lives, our worldviews. So I maybe would like to finish with this broadening up of our approach to these issues. And also say that we are looking at mining here but there's also renewables conflicts exploding everywhere in the global south, but also in the global north. So I think if we look at the broader picture, we are really facing a, a global, not only extractive crisis, but also a massive uh, land use crisis, social crisis, human rights crisis that we actually, I don't think it would, it would be possible to mine all the metals they are needed. So 
I think we will be faced with these questions very soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. We're, we're now uh, going to close this session very soon. I would like to invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras. Um, we'll say one last word before saying goodbye uh, to our audience and reminding our, also our panelists that um, we have a, uh, another social online social gathering after this one on a separate link that we'll send you by email. Um, but uh, maybe in a, if you could keep it short, in 30 seconds, we'll go a last round table. What would be your final words uh, for tonight that you would like to share with um, the audience? Some in the audience are um, solidarity people that want to support you. Some in the audience are government people that are uh, listening to you. And some in the audience are industry people too. So uh, who wants to start? Maybe we could do the same order we started, um, maybe with uh, uh, Dimitri um, as the, and, and May for your, your case. And then we'll, we'll go to Gary and uh, Clemente, I see he's not there, but Sarah after. So go ahead, uh, Dimitri and May, your last uh, few second word. Yeah, um, thanks for, for the webinar, uh, great panelists. Um, just maybe the final conclusion mm -hmm. from my side, at least. Um, everyone who hears us today, just next time you see an ad or you're going shopping for a new laptop, new phone, new Tesla, if you already have one, um, just think about it. Look at the videos again that we showed you and um, think what it cost to us. And uh, that's all I'm asking you to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. May? Uh, the message that we could use and send to the government that we could send to the government is to respect the voices of the citizens when they are expressed to take into account their concerns to do things in such a way that we control the mining industry and not to destroy the delicate areas Professors that are, that are totally incompatible with mining activities. We are living through a drama. There are citizens that ha have mental health problems uh, the, the, because of the installations that are present. The environment is going to suffer. We don't say we, we are a jewel for our, ecotourism and we are basically disrespecting uh, this jewel to uh, to for to have a supposedly sustainable economy and that's not true we're destroying rather uh, there are other ways to uh, to uh, reach our our ends of we could friends we have conditions for better ways of modernizing uh, transport. So this is my message directly for the government. Merci, May. Thank you, May. Uh, Gary? Gary. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be sitting here with, with everybody. Thank you all who attended, the participants, the panelists. Um, yeah, out here, um, we're, we're descendants of of important people to you know to our our history what we are doing out here is fighting and protecting for our our people and our ancestors we're speaking out we're we're honoring our our ancestors wishes we're part of that prayer um we're, we're totally non-violent we're approaching this in a prayerful way pro people pro environment the real stewards of the land throwing a protection blanket over our resources, our water and our air. Um, we're still struggling for, you know, in, in, in the court system kind of way, um, but we're not going to give up. You know, we're, we're, we're still here. We're going to remain here and we plan 
we plan to continue to utilize our land with our ceremonies, our gatherings. Our, we're going to continue to teach our young, our our youngsters, our our little ones, our children. It's for the kids. We're, our our main purpose for fighting fighting these um, destruction on our land is for our kids, for our kids, for our future. They're our 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 future, and it's really it. If we show them how to take care of our land, how to how to care for one another as human beings. We're going to be in good shape in 40 to 50 years, and we don't have enough experience to say otherwise, but we do know that if we work together and we continue to work together, we can make this change, and it's good, good, beautiful change, and it's happening in all of our countries. And so everybody out there that's listening, you know, and if your communities are going through some struggles right now, keep your head up, keep fighting, keep, keep doing what you're doing for the people, for, for our little ones. Keep up that fight. You're doing good. We're all doing good. You know, we're 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 doing that honor. I'm proud of each and every one of us. Let's keep it up. Aho. Thank you. Ho. Uh, John Hatter, who works closely with Gary and others in uh, Nevada. A uh, couple. Th one thing I just say is that, uh, in addition to what's already been said, is that in the case of Factor Pass, what we saw was a very rushed process, a very poor environmental review. And this would set a very dangerous pre precedent for the mining future. We have to stand up against these projects that are poorly conceived and do not have uh, community consent. Otherwise, we're looking at potentially what I would see another generation of <clears throat> destructive, uh, unnecessarily destructive mining and perhaps even poorer practices than we see today. So it's important to stand up. Thank you, John. I think we are moving to Sarah now uh, because Clemente is not there, right? Uh, correct, Ivana? So Sarah, your last uh, words? There's no doubt for me that with all the experiences that have been shared today that have been very enriching for uh, all of us, uh, those of us who are environmentalists, uh, we're, you know, we've been able to see how people live uh, and we've been thinking about how our children and grandchildren are going to be living. Well, I am committed to this fight. I am going to continue supporting all of these organizations that um, are, are numerous here in the Putayendo Valley. We're going to continue fighting against this invasion uh, that mining companies are uh, doing here in uh, our communities. We want for our governments to at the very least stop the processes that have already been started. And we want to look carefully, we want the governments to look carefully at what these mineral deposits uh, can, can bring to the local communities and in terms of, you know, both the good and bad. We need to put uh, the place more value on human life and defend the land where we live. There are people that have been here their entire lives. For me, it's not the case, but I have been here for a long time and I love this land. And uh, the other conclusion that I came to, which is perhaps very simple, um, but it, it's just that I have seen that this issue is not just here in Chile, it's everywhere. Mining is causing environmental and social conflicts all around the world and they are very deep and very significant conflicts and so i think all of us need to be united and we need to fight together because it is for the survival of humanity we need to make sure that we save water sources so that no community is without safe water and this is uh, for rural regions here in Chile, where we want to make sure that we have uh, schools and healthcare for these rural peoples here specifically. 
Uh, we need to make sure that uh, rural peoples have the same rights as those living in the cities. Uh, we have, uh, you know, schools and uh, kindergartens and all of these different um, resources because there is clean water and without it, we would lose all of this. So we need to raise awareness about the resources that we need in order to keep this alive. So we need to not just cross our arms and give up, we need to continue. And that's all I wanted to add as a conclusion. Gracias. Gracias, Sara. Merci. Thank, Thank you, you, Sarah. Uh, Yannick and uh, then Mariana, your last words. Go ahead, Yannick. So first of all, thank you to everyone who came to listen to us. And thank you to May, Dimitri, John, Gary, Sarah, and Clemente for their talks. I think that it is from the words that they shared that we can see this contradiction in the world today. So we are asking these questions now about who, whose hands is this in? Whose hands is the power in? Who is this for? What is it for? So we've looked at this uh, technological transformation in a much deeper way. There are things that need to be rectified and we've looked into that. If we are sacrificing villages and lands, well, we need to look carefully at that. Should we be sacrificing this dominant model that we are working within right now instead? I think that the uh, documenting the cases, well, we in the past have looked generally at what is happening in the global north in Canada, in Europe, and people were not necessarily looking at the global south and all of the issues of corruption there. People have often thought there's no way to control it, even though supposedly there are countries where there is more environmental regulation. Well, we realize that uh, things are overlooked in some cases and uh, the impacts uh, are not being managed properly. And uh, there have been these ag aggressive measures of doing things in all parts of the world this whole time. So we need to look at what kind of activities we need and what helps uh, society rather than uh, the markets. We are looking at this uh, hegemonic energy transition and we need to be sure to show that there are other possibilities. This isn't the only route that we can take. There are also uh, democratic uh, grassroots uh, um, options. There are many different types of initiatives. We need to focus on the fact that there isn't just one technological path to take. So I think this is something that needs to be discussed and it requires work on many different levels. I think that there are a lot of gaps that we need to shed light on so that we can uh, counteract all of these problems that we are facing. Thank you, Yannick. And uh, Mariana, your closing words for tonight? No, it would be short. Acabaré en castellano mareando a los traductores. First of all, I would like to thank all of the panelists uh, who uh, have not just been participating today, but over the course of several months now. And you can see the results of their work in the Environmental Justice uh, Atlas. And then I would also like to thank all of the participants that have been here for two hours. And there are many of you. I would like to finish with an invitation. I want to invite 
all of you to uh, participate in this mapping process in uh, North America, but also on a global level. So all of these projects uh, around mining and other types of conflicts that we need to be following. Uh, of course, 25 cases or approximately 40 in the interactive map are just a very small sample of the conflicts that are currently underway and getting worse. And of course, there will be new ones over the uh, coming months. So I wanted to end on that invitation. This atlas is seeking to expand the mapping process. And we uh, want to do this collaboratively, continue to be uh, collaborative in this work in Latin America and elsewhere in the world. So if you would like to be part of this process, you are extremely welcome. And thank you very much. And uh, we also invite you to consult the report that is in Spanish and will soon be in English. And the interactive map is already in several languages. And as we mentioned, uh, things will be uh, updated over the coming months. Thank you very much to Mining Watch Canada for uh, facilitating today and for sharing all the PowerPoints and the videos and uh, organizing everything. I'd also like to thank the interpreters who uh, have had a difficult job today with so many different languages. And I think that it's been uh, wonderful to give people the opportunity to express themselves in their native language. So uh, we're grateful to uh, have had this opportunity. We know that logistically it can be difficult, but that is a really wonderful thing. Uh, this, uh, you know, accepting diversity in this way and making sure that we allow uh, people of different backgrounds to join in. So thank you, um, Hugo and Viviana, and uh, to uh, the interpreters once again and we hope to be able to share the video with you soon so that you can uh, see uh, you can watch uh, these uh, this uh, webinar once again uh, calmly on your own time thank you gracias mariana thank, thank you, thank you mariana. mariana it's probably uh, close to midnight where you are now <laughs> so a well-deserved uh, end of night for you uh, viviana do you want to share some last thoughts for tonight so we can close the meeting? Yeah, I'm just going to say in 20 seconds that uh, at the end of the day, to summarize at least how I see it, is that uh, this is all about water. This is all about protecting life. And as you know, as May uh, rightly put it in her presentation, this is just about distract, uh, distracting these resources, distracting life, trying to distract um, water. And I really like the, the concept of sustainable distraction because this is what this is all about. So water, protecting life and protecting water. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of the panelists for being here with us and being so clear. And yeah, thank you for, for being with us and for this initiative, for being part of the initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Viviana, and I'm, I'm just going to thank uh, Val and the whole technical team behind the scene and the whole Mining Watch Canada team and everyone that uh, joined us. I will also thank um, uh, the spirits, actual and past, ancestors and future generations that are not here today, but we should all be thinking of, of them past and forward. So thank you all and have a good night and keep up the good work. Goodbye. <laughs>